Hello ladies and gentlemen, today we're back in War Thunder and we're looking at a pretty special aircraft. This is the French Premium Yak-9T and the reason why it's in the game is because it is the 75th anniversary of the Normandy Nieman. Now if you don't know about them or who they are, we're gonna, or I'm going to go through some uh, historic stuff for you, uh, you know, in a little bit. Basically, you can guess the Yak-9T in the French tree for 1,700 Golden Eagles from November the 24th, uh, 2 o'clock or 2 p.m. GMT, to November the 27th, 9 a.m. GMT. So pretty much this weekend, it is on offer for you. I'm guessing it will be gone after this, and maybe you'll only be able to get it in the Warbond shop. So I think it's a decent pickup if you've got the uh, Golden Eagles lying around. At the same time, in this um, offer, you can also get uh, Marcel Albert's uh, Normandy Nieman ca uh, camo or camouflage or skin for the Yak 3 at a 50% discount. And you also have the opportunity to get the Normandy Nieman decal. You can pretty much just fly any Yak uh, above the Yak 1, so Yak 3 and onwards to all the Yak 9s. And you need to get 60, 40, or 20 ABRBSB uh, aircraft kills over the weekend. So that's pretty much it. And just to show you that it does cost 1700 you can see right here that I was able to purchase it for 1700 Golden Eagles. At the same time, this is a René Chalet, or Chal. <laughs> it's a premium Yak-9 T fighter, so it does have a name attached to it, which is nice. So, what is the difference between this and the Russian Yak? Absolutely bloody nothing. They're exactly the same. You can see the Yak-9 T right here. It's straight copied over with a camouflage. So, if you really enjoy the Yak-9 T, and you really like, I don't know, the 37 on it, then this is going to be a good pickup. At the same time, as you can see the armor on it, it has 64 millimeters of bulletproof glass on the front, 64 on the back, and also 8 millimeters of steel plate, where pretty much the chair is for the good old pilot there. If we look at the X-ray view, it has the 37 millimeter mounted in the nose, and it's also got the Klimov VK105PF 12-cylinder inline with 1,200 horsepower. A pretty powerful engine for this machine. And it also has the offensive armament to the 12.7mm with only 200 rounds. Very reminiscent of every other Russian aircraft that you guess. Pretty big guns, not a lot of ammo. Uh, that's pretty much it. Because it's premium, you get all of the um, modifications for free. But let's say you're grinding out the Russian version uh, in the normal tree. What I would say is go for the flight performance and the survivability first. Uh, focus on survivability, so get cover before you get engines and wings repair if you're able to. Or, uh, you know, basically just focus on these two. You don't really need the offensive 37mm belts because the APT and the Hefe T uh, does a lot of damage anyway. If you really want to use it in a realistic, then obviously go for the belts because you can maximize the amount of rounds where, you know, you basically just have Heffy just firing at the enemy doing a lot of damage. Uh, since uh, we're talking about the Russian one, so you can use it in ground forces right now, APT is also good, 60 millimeters of penetration, pretty much go through the top of the majority of tanks at 4.3, and also go through the engine deck, which is always fun to do. If we're talking about the French variants, um, obviously everything is unlocked, but if it does ever come into the tree, which it might do, uh, uh, along with some other Russian aircraft, maybe uh, staying off on the offensive belts and trying to get the other upgrades first is something to do. If we're talking about the 12.7mm, pretty much every single offensive uh, belt is good, apart from default, so make sure to change that. My favorite is the ground targets APIC, API, API, APIT, IAI. Pretty much a lot of AP, a lot of fire, and just a bit of a, a cement core in there just to help you out. APIT is also good. Uh, pretty much universal is just a mixture of these two, so very good. Air targets, uh, APIT, IAI, all the great stuff, and stealth if you want to be a little bit sneaky. But with the 37mm, it's not exactly the easiest to be sneaky. <laughs> so maybe you don't really uh, care about that. If we look at the customization 
Unfortunately, this machine does not get a different camouflage to the one that it has. But the one that it does have does have some really nice uh, features. So you have uh, this little head here, as you can see, which is still in pretty high definition. We're on max uh, settings right now. Obviously, the number 60 with the Russian stars and the wonderful free French uh, colors on the nose. A nice uh, little addition. And if you have a look, it sits right here in the tech tree. Hopefully a lot of people pick this up because I think it'll be very useful if you want to grind out uh, some of the French tech tree pretty much up to rank 4 it'll be useful for. Uh, if you don't want to drop any money on the D371 or the Naval, I think this is a good pickup in order to uh, grind out the tree when it's fully available to everyone. So anyway, we're going to get into some historical uh, talking. So instead of talking about the Ag-9T, I thought it would be interesting to talk about the Normandy uh, Niemen. These were the guys who were part of the Free French, and they volunteered to fight for, or at least with, the Russians on the Eastern Front against the Germans. So we're going to be talking about how they were formed, how they fought, and how many were there, and all of the other little details uh, in that. So on the 22nd of June 1941, the German troops invaded the Soviet Union, uh, part of the start of Operation Barbarossa. General de Gaulle at the time decided that the Free French should be represented on all fronts of the fight, and therefore uh, decided that sending a French division to Russia was a good idea. So, the biggest issue with this is obviously getting the materials, the men over there, and also getting the Russians to agree, uh, because obviously uh, the politics of the Free French and the USSR at the time didn't exactly line up too well. So, he had to revise some of his plans, and while uh, meeting with the Soviet government, they came to an agreement and he decided to send a French fighter group to fight alongside the Red Army as part of Operation Barbarossa by the Germans. So the negotiations for uh, this agreement began in February 1942, and then they were finally fully agreed upon by the USSR on the 26th of November in the same year. So it took a long time, uh, 10 months I believe if I've got my maths right, to get this uh, negotiations finished and going through. Uh, in the meantime, while all of this was going on, General Valen, who was uh, the commander of the Free French Air Forces, he received an order to form an aerial unit which would uh, comprise of companies from Great Britain, North Africa and the Near East of the Free French uh, Airmen. The number three, uh, 3 fighter group was created on the 1st of September 1942 and it was under the command of a lad called Commander uh, Pulikan. And it was formed in Rayak, which is in uh, Lebanon, and it took the name of uh, Normandy. And then on the 12th of November 1942, the group's 60 volunteer pilots and mechanics set off uh, to the Soviet Union, so straight after the negotiations had finished. They went via Baghdad, and then Basra, and then Tehran. Uh, the destination that they ended up at was Ivanovo, which was an airbase about 250 kilometers northeast of Moscow. The uh, group's uh, majority arrived at the end of November, or beginning of December, in the same year of 1942, and in uh, March 1943 they were joined by the last sections which uh, got stuck in Iran. Uh, so, by the time of March 1943, the Normandy Airmen were able to all get to the USSR. They started straight away on training on Soviet equipment in incredibly harsh weather conditions, temperatures from minus 25 degrees to minus 30. Absolutely horrible conditions. Myself, I've actually uh, been in those conditions in Calgary and it's just not fun at all. Uh, just keeping warm is a bit of a struggle. And then in uh, February 1943, Commander Pulikan, uh, he was transferred to a military mission at Moscow and therefore was replaced by another commander by the name of Tulasny, or Tulaz, however you say that. Sorry about my French. 
In March uh, the following year, uh, the squadron was equipped with some Yakovlev Yak-1 aircraft. They were also uh, involved on the German-Soviet front at the time. The Soviets emerged as the winners of the Battle of Stalingrad, uh, but the German resistance to the counteroffensive was pretty much unremitting at the time. Um, therefore, incorporated into the first uh, Soviet airborne army, the unit temporarily came under the 204th Aerial Bombardment Division. Uh, it was based in the Monokunino uh, region between Smolensk and Oryl. Oh, sorry. Uh, it was based in uh, Makunino area near Polotniany Zavod, which was 100 kilometers southwest of Moscow, and then they began to operate in the region uh, between Smolensk and Orel, uh, carrying out various reconnaissance and escort missions, so very similar to uh, what you would see other nations do for Britain in the Battle of Britain before this. Obviously, the trusting element uh, was not there yet uh, in that time. So on the 5th of April, 1943, the squadron engaged in some combat. Uh, the mission was escorting bomber aircraft between Roslavl and Smolensk. Uh, after enduring enemy anti-aircraft fire, it was attacked by a fighter patrol. And during the battle, two of its pilots, uh, Preziosi and Durand, uh, brought its first two victories uh, by bringing down a FW-190 or a Fokker Wolf. Uh, the first mission uh, was a success, which is great compared to uh, what happened in the Battle of France. And uh, thanks uh, from the, uh, basically mainly thanks to the support of the French squadron at the time. And the Soviet bombers uh, returned to the base without sustaining any losses, so they did their escorting very well. Uh, from then on, they were regularly involved in combat operations. So, uh, basically, it's pretty much the Polish deal. The Polish had to prove themselves to the British command to be involved in the Battle of Britain. Once they were able to do that, then they were just fully fledged on operation all the time. And some of the Polish pilots became some of the great aces of Battle of Britain uh, because of this. The French basically did the same in the USSR, especially... Uh, once Operation Barbarossa had ground to a halt. But anyway, uh, eight days later, after the first incursion, uh, there were many other victories. So during another fighter mission in the Spaz Demensk sector, six French patrol aircraft under attack from forces superior in number, they brought down three German fighters. And on the 13th of April, well, it didn't go as well. It was a day of mourning. Uh, the squadron grieved its first three losses. Lieutenants Deville, Poznansky, and Officer Bizienne. Uh, they did not return from this mission. And then on the 16th of April and onwards, the French took Masalsk, uh, situated some 40 kilometers from their lines. And the escort missions and attacks on German columns and aerodromes followed. So they basically just kept ramping up operations. And now, the unit was incorporated into the 303rd Aerial Fighter Division, which was under the command of General Zakharov of the 1st Airborne Army, 3rd Belarusian Front. Uh, in June and July, uh, some new pilots arrived, so to give them some reinforcements, two squadrons were formed out of them, showing that, you know, there was more confidence now in the Free French from the USSR. Uh, the Rouen and the Le Havre uh, under the command of Commander Pouillard and Captain Litolf, uh, respectively. Uh, the Battle of Arel began on the 10th of July, and after a few scuffles, the fighting intensified. Between the 12th and the 19th, the group, about 15 pilots strong and equipped with some Yak-9 aircraft, so definite upgrade over the Yak-1s, carried out 112 sorties and brought down 17 planes. So a pretty decent, uh, pretty pretty decent number there. Uh, you know, uh, one of the interesting things that you don't really hear about the war, you only really hear about the really successful missions. But a lot of the time, it was just kind of flying about, uh, especially if you count stuff like escort missions or patrol missions, where nothing uh, would really uh, would really happen. Um, and then losses were heavy, unfortunately. So they did bring down seventeen planes, but six pilots including uh, Commander Tull uh, Lazny, 
who uh, he disappeared on the 17th of July 1943 during an attack on a German motorized column. Commander Pouillard uh, then took command of the group, which comprised of just eight able-bodied men. So by this time, they had battled so hard they'd lost so many uh, pilots by this point. And then on the 4th of August, the French mechanics were replaced by Soviet ones under the command of Captain Agavelian. The Normandy squadron, uh, which once again received, re received uh, reinforcements, moved on towards Smolensk. Uh, it carried out several missions in the Lelnia and Smolensk sectors. Everywhere it went, uh, the group distinguished itself, accumulating victories, but the losses were terrible, so basically going fist on fist instead of uh, playing it a bit more safe. 1943 was a pretty bad year for the uh, free French men in the USSR. So following the first six months of fighting, 21 pilots had died, uh, or been taken prisoner, or disappeared, and four, other w four others were wounded. So that's 25 out of action. On the 6th of November, the few survivors of the group, uh, which had now tallied up more than 70 victories to their name, withdrew to Tula for the winter. So during the winter of 1943 to 1944, the group was reorganized, so 52 new pilots from North Africa arrived as reinforcements, and the group was increased to four squadrons. We had the Sherberg and then the Khan uh, were added to the Rouen and the Le Havre. At the end of May, uh, the regiment returned to the front, so after the winter break, they were straight back into the action. In June, it took part in supporting the Soviet offensive of Belarus and then in Lithuania, and then in less than three weeks, the Soviet troops advanced more than 400 kilometers to the west. In July, the group took part in the battle to breach the uh, Neyman, which was a big river at the time, ensuring the protection of the troops. The Red Army managed to open a gap in the enemy's lines more than 200 kilometers wide and 500 deep, which was insane. And then for its daring deeds, the Normandy received the title Neyman Regiment from the Soviet Supreme Commander, and thus became the Normandy Neyman. So that's basically where they got uh, their full name from, or at least the name you see in game. And then on the 16th of October 1944, the Prussian offensive began. So in just one day, the regiment equipped uh, with Yak-3 planes, so once again, another uh, you know increase in efficiency, brought down 29 aircraft without any losses. What an amazing day uh, from the French airmen there. And then after a week of fighting, the first Soviet units breached the German lines, and there were numerous assignments against the enemy rear guard uh, from the Free French. On the 27th of November, pilots landed for the first time on Prussian territory. On the 6th of December 1944, all the men of the Normandy Niemen arrived in Moscow to meet General de Gaulle on an official visit to the Soviet Union. The regiment's pennant thus came to bear the Croix de la Libération, or the Liberation Cross. So for all of their great fighting, they were all awarded the Liberation Cross. And it just kind of shows over this time how confidence in them grew from the USSR and the higher-ups. And it's just, it's really nice to see that, you know, they were able to really put their foot into the war. But anyway, moving on. The Commander Pouillard, uh, followed by the regiment, regiment's old hands, he returned to France, so he'd pretty much uh, retired to nobility, basically. And then Commander Delfino then took over at the head of the regiment. The third campaign that they uh, took part in uh, was between January and May 1945 in the Konigsberg region in eastern Prussia. So German troops tried in vain to resist the Soviet advance. The last pockets of resistance fell one after another as Berlin was surrounded. In both the east and the west, the defeated German troops capitulated in Berlin on the 9th of May. So pretty much the feeling at this time was the hard fighting was done. The, hard, the only hard fighting left would be to take Berlin since they would fight to the end. Uh, so... It was only a question of days at this point uh, before the uh, squadrons returned to France because you've got to remember by this point the D-Day landings had taken part and the Allied forces were pushing from the west. On the 1st of June 1945 the regiment was in Moscow 
and then to their great delight, the pilots of the Normandy Niemen learned that the USSR had donated the 40 Yak-3 aircraft flown by the regiment to France. On the 15th of June, it was at the controls of their aircraft that they took off from the airstrip at Elbing on the 20th, following stopovers in Prague, Stuttgart and Saint-Dizier. They arrived at Le Bourget to a triumphant welcome. Can you imagine that feeling after being away for, you know, uh, two plus years and then coming back to a triumphant welcome after really doing your job and helping out in a world where the world already believed that you were lost? Like, can just, just imagine that. Like, your country falls, but you still want to push on. You still want to fight for your allies. That's basically the feeling that the Polish had, that the French had, that the Czechs had. All of this, and it's just, it's a really wonderful thing to think of. So after more than 5,000 sorties and 869 combats, the Normandy Niemen Regiment had a total of 273 official victories and 37 maybe ones or probable ones. Uh, 46 out of the 100 or so pilots that had passed through its ranks were dead or missing. Cited 11 times, the Normandy Niemen was decorated with the Legion d'Honneur, or the Legion of Honor, the Croix uh, de la Libération, the Médaille Militaire, or the Military Medal, and the Croix de Guerre, uh, the War Cross, with six palms, as well as the Soviet Orders of the Red Flag and Alexander Nevsky. So they lost a lot of their pilots, which is very much a shame, but it just shows how bloody the uh, Eastern Front was, even if you weren't always on the front lines, which these guys were for the majority of the time, but at the start they definitely weren't. So after the war had ended, when Germany surrendered uh, in Berlin on the 9th of May 1945, uh, the group was actually not disbanded. So from 1945 to 1947, uh, Fighter Group 35 with its Yak-3s and NC-900 aircraft became the 2-6 fighter group and received some English mosquitoes. From October 1949 to May of 51, they were equipped with P-63 King Cobras and then Hellcats, and they took part in the Indochina War from 1946 to 54. In December 1951, the group left for Iran in Algeria, where in June 1952 it received its first jet fighter, the Mistral. On the 17th of November 1952, the Normandy, <coughs> the Normandy Niemen fighter group split into two squadrons, the 1-6 Orani and the 2-6 Normandy Niemen, thus forming the 6th fighter squadron. After the war in Algeria from 54 to 62, it became the 230 all-time fighter squadron based in Orange, where it was given the responsibility for the aerial defense of the southeast of France. In June 66, the squadron took over the Reims Air Base, where in 76 it received the Air Force's first Mirage, the F-1C. And then in 1993, the group moved to Colmar and became the 113 fighter squadron. With the dissolution of the 13th Fighter Squadron in 95, it became, it became the 230 Fighter Squadron once again. The squadron has been involved in several peacekeeping operations, such as Operation Turquoise in Rwanda and Operation Deny Flight in Bosnia-Herzegovina, under the UN and in Kosovo alongside NATO. And then on the 3rd of July 2009, the squadron was officially suspended. So the Normandy Niemen Museum, which was established in Anderley, uh, in the Eure Department, will close permanently at the end of 2010, so it's already closed, and its collections are being taken by the Air and Space Museum in Le Bourget. So the Normandy Niemen may be reformed in 2011 and 2012 at the Mont de Marsan Air Base. I don't know if they are still around today, but I really hope they are, because it really is a mark in history. These guys fought bravely not just for their country, but for another country, while also using that country's fighters. They had to gain respect, so they had to gain the confidence of people who had never seen them before. People who probably all they heard is that Germany had just rolled over France, 
and they probably had no faith in these men, but they were able to push through, to gain the confidence of their superiors, gain a bunch of medals, fight hard, and establish France as not just the guys who surrendered in 1940, but the free French who fought on to battle one last day. Let's get on to some gameplay. So with the addition of the Yak-9T as a premium vehicle for the French at rank 3 battle rating 4.3, what you get is a vehicle that the French is sadly lacking, and this is pretty much a multi-purpose vehicle. You can look at the VB and talk about how good of a supportive fighter it is, but if it comes to anything else in the game, it's not great at. You can talk about the MB, the 157, and how maybe in a one-on-one -on -one engagement it's... Uh, pretty good as long as it's not against a P-47, but once again, it's not good in many other ways. The Yak-9T gives you a little bit of versatility that you definitely need in the French air tree, which it also brings to the Russian tree. So as you can see here, the first thing we do is nail a BV, chop off its tail, which no other French aircraft really has the ability to do. Nothing really has the 37mm, all they have are 20mm, which sometimes really struggle on uh, doing a lot of damage, especially to the large bombers. And that's not even talking about the fact that the machines which, for France, can kill the BVs cannot get up to them before they get to the bases. As you saw with the Yak-90 here, I was able to get to it just as the BV went over the base basically meaning that he wouldn't be able to hit any of the other ones. If I was in the VB, in this case, I wouldn't be anywhere near this altitude. So, the fact that it is a multi-purpose fighter, the fact that it sits at rank 3, making it uh, able to grind rank 2, 3, and 4 aircraft with ease as a premium vehicle, it suits the French sides very well. It means that it adds that little bit of help that the French generally need in this game. Because the issue is, if you get a full French team, and let's say the Yak-9T doesn't exist, as I said, you have a bunch of fighters which are pretty good in their roles, but they're only stuck to their roles. So if the enemy team decides to fight in a different specific way, they decide to outclimb you, force you down, you don't have an aircraft that can get you out of that situation. But with the Yak-9T, it is able to do that if you load the air target belts on the 37mm and use it uh, to great effect. Also, with the change to sparking mechanics, or whatever you want to call them, the uh, Yak-9T's 37mm has definitely become more effective. Something that's really nice as well, just from a French uh, perspective after playing the tree for a very long time, the fact that we have a fighter which rolls well, which elevator responds well, which has very nice uh, landing flaps, meaning that you can do a lovely loop in it, and the fact that I can actually outmaneuver a German aircraft is just something that I've been sadly missing in the aircraft that the French have offered, apart from the VG-33, which I feel incredibly confident in. The Yak 9T just makes it nice at 4.3 to actually fly French against the Germans. And it's sad that we have to add in a Russian aircraft for that feeling to come back, but unfortunately, that's what you're going to get if you throw in the MB 157 and the VBs as well. Uh, the only other aircraft which is very similar to the Yak 9T in the French tree is the King Cobra, which of course is American. Now, when I pictured the French aircraft tree, I thought they would add in a bunch of Russian planes, basically because of the Free French, using the Yak-3s, the Yak-9s, and even the Yak-1s. Now, it is really sad that we don't have them in the main tree. At least we have them in some form as a premium vehicle, giving a bit of balance to the force that is uh, French. Hopefully, what we see in the future is a bunch of Yaks which are put into the game into the main tree uh, since they were used by uh, the Free French in the USSR.
maybe we even get some British vehicles. I mean, it will pretty pretty much become an international tree at some point. But anyway, let's talk about this match. So first of all, we killed a BV. Second of all, at high altitude, we were able to duel uh, very slightly with a few aircraft. And then what we had to do is we had to disengage because there was too many of them. The Germans fall for the base. They go straight down. All of our fighters, which were at the center of the map, come back in and we still have altitude to attack from. So because the Yang-9T can dive at about 680, you're not going to be able to outdive the majority of the German aircraft. But if they're in a situation like this, where they are used to absolutely dicking on French planes in this scenario, the Yang-9T comes in and can do a lot of work. Now, don't worry about that shot. Uh, nobody saw that. That didn't exist. What you really want to focus on is the next 5 to 10 seconds, because that shows that I can actually shoot this gun and not miss every single damn shot and can only hit a BV. So first shot hits, doesn't do a lot, second shot blows the plane apart. Isn't that just a wonderful feeling uh, when you get that? And once again, looping well, something that no other um, French plane does as well as the Yak-9T apart from something like the uh, King Cobra. Using the landing flaps to get a really nice loop, uh, not really caring about energy lost because this guy is pretty much done for because of it. But as you can see, just the ease of using a yak is so nice compared to the struggles of spading out the VB, the struggles of the MB, and the general just boringness of playing the other American aircraft that I've already played in the game. The Yak-19, yes, I have played it before. Yes, it is a reskin of a plane in a main tech tree, but it is also premium, and it also gives something to the French tree, which I think the Americans really don't. The Americans don't give that uh, balanced fighter which you need to fight around. The King Cobra, you can definitely make an argument that the King Cobra does that, but in my opinion, the King Cobra doesn't have that ability against stuff like the BF-109, such as the G2 Trop and the F4 that you fight. It just doesn't have the ability to fight them on the same playing field that something like a Yak-9 T does. It is nice to see it. I hope we see more Russian planes in the standard tree. Hopefully they're not all limited time premiums like this Yak-9 T. But if you do want to get a hold of this uh, version of the Yak-9 T, you will have to uh, go to the link in the description, have a look at the article, and also uh, buy it. Remember, it does disappear at the end of the weekend. I hope you all have a wonderful day, and I'll see you next time.